Why do some people seem to remember everything they learn while others forget it within days? Well, in this video, I'm going to explain how you can stop forgetting what you learn using five evidence-based principles from cognitive science that I use daily as both a teacher and sovereign learner. By the end of this video, you'll understand the primary mechanisms that make learning stick, the most common mistakes to avoid, and you'll also have a four-step plan on how exactly to implement this. Let's start with the most counterintuitive principle. Chapter 1. The Fluency Illusion you know that moment when you're reading something and you really want to make sure that you get it? So you read it again, and again, and by the fifth time, it's feeling familiar. You recognize the concepts, and you're confident that you're absorbing the material. But the next day, someone asks you about it, and suddenly, you blank. You know what's in there, you felt confident, but for some reason you can't recall what you just learned. How is that possible? Well, in 2006, two researchers at Washington University decided to test this. They gave 180 college students scientific passages to learn and split them into three groups with four five-minute periods each. Group one did four study sessions, so they read the passage over and over. Group two had three study sessions, then one test. Group three had one study session and then three tests. Five minutes after, some of the subjects were tested. Group one, the rereading group, scored highest at 83% while group three, the retesting group, got 71%. Then when asked to rate how confident they felt that they'd remember it a week later, the rereading group was the most confident. So far, rereading looks like the winner. But when another group took the same test a week later, everything flipped. The retesting group scored 61%, while the confident rereading group scored 40%. Despite reading the passage 14 times, the rereading group lost over half of what they had learned, while the retesting group, who had only read the passage three times, forgot only 14%. Again, the students who were most exposed to the information and felt most confident and familiar with the material did worse in the long run. They fell victim to the fluency illusion, a metacognitive bias where we mistake how easily we absorb information with how deeply we've actually learned it. Every time they reread the passages, it felt more familiar and easier to process. Their brains then misinterpreted this processing ease as evidence of learning. Okay, but how is processing ease not evidence of learning? And why does retesting beat rereading? Well, it comes down to the fact that your brain has two different kinds of strength. Chapter 2. Retrieval Strength versus Storage Strength in 1992, cognitive psychologists Robert and Elizabeth Bjork proposed that memories have two different kinds of strength. Storage strength is how solidly a memory is built and linked to what you already know. It grows slowly through meaningful connections and practice, and once it's strong, it fades very little over time. Retrieval strength is how easy it is to recall a memory right now. It varies quickly based on how often and how recently you've used it and on any cues that might bring it to mind. Basically, imagine that your brain is a massive warehouse full of knowledge. Storage strength is how securely an item is stored, how well it's wrapped and labeled. The more connections it has to other items, the harder it is to lose. Retrieval strength is how easy it is to grab right now. If the item was used recently or it's sitting near the front, it'll be easy to find. But if it's buried in the back where the lights are dim, it'll be harder to retrieve even if it's securely stored. So hopefully you can see now how this maps to the experiment. Rereading boosted short-term performance, aka retrieval strength, in the short run, but it didn't actually change the way that it was stored. It just kept bringing it back to the front, but did little to strengthen storage. As the authors of Make It Stick, the science of successful learning write, doing multiple readings in close succession is a time-consuming study strategy that yields negligible benefits at the expense of much more effective strategies that take less time. Okay, fine, I get it, rereading is trash, but how do we boost storage strength then? Well, those are the next three chapters of this video. Chapter 3. Space it out. The first recommendation is pretty simple. If you want to remember something long term, don't cram it all at once. Instead, space your learning sessions out over time. This is called the spacing effect, and it's one of the most studied phenomena in all of cognitive psychology. In 2006, Cepeda et al. analyzed 317 experiments with thousands of participants spanning several decades. Out of 271 statistical comparisons between cramming and spacing, only 12 comparisons showed no benefit from spacing. That means, across decades of research, spacing resulted in better retention than cramming over 95% of the time. And the reason researchers think it works is kind of counterintuitive. 
So when you space out your learning, you actually allow some forgetting to occur between sessions. To revisit our metaphor from earlier, the information gradually moves to the back of the warehouse. Then when you need to recall the information after some time has passed, your brain has to work much harder to retrieve it. Instead of just grabbing information from the front of the warehouse, it needs to go all the way to the back, locate it, and haul it from the back of the warehouse all the way to the front again. And it's that effortful retrieval, the successful journey from the back of the warehouse all the way to the front again, that makes memories stronger. Each time you successfully retrieve something that was hard to access, the information gets better organized, more connections are built, and it becomes more resistant to future forgetting. Cramming, by contrast, does the opposite. It keeps the information at the front of the warehouse where it's easy to grab, which makes you feel like you're improving, but because retrieving it is always so easy, your brain never gets the signal to strengthen the way that it's stored. Okay, but how do I actually apply this? Well, it's pretty simple. Instead of studying for something all at once, space your learning sessions out over time. So if you have an exam in a week, and if you do, you shouldn't be watching this video, you should go be studying. Study on day one, day three, and day six. Now you might be thinking, okay, this sounds great in theory, but how do I actually apply this to something practical like learning a new language? Well, a while back, I challenged myself to learn as much French as I could in 30 days, then have real conversations with strangers in France. I knew that I couldn't just wing it, so I built the entire challenge around our sponsor, Buzu. I actually earned my B1 certificate through Buzu, so I can personally vouch for how effective it is. Buzu is a self-led language learning platform with bite-sized, expert-designed lessons in 14 different languages. Each course takes you step-by-step -step through the official CEFR levels, so if you're tired of the constant guesswork and are looking for a clear path that actually works, Buzu is it. The lessons are short, about 10 minutes each, but they're designed by language experts and build towards real conversations. They're also supported by smart AI tools that give you instant feedback so you can correct mistakes right on the spot. On top of that, you can practice directly with native speakers in the app. I remember one time I submitted mumbled French slang for one of the speaking exercises and got very emphatic corrections from a French speaker. Needless to say, it was nerve-wracking, but it's what actually pushed me to improve. Boozer prepares you for conversations that matter, whether you're traveling, working, or just talking to friends and family. But the best part is that you don't need to commit to anything up front. Buzu has a freemium model, so you can start learning for free anytime, anywhere, for as long as you want. And if you want the full experience, things like offline mode, grammar review, and full personalized paths, you can sign up for Buzu Premium with a free seven day trial. So whether your goal is travel, career, or just personal growth, Buzu gives you the structure, community, and feedback you need to finally stick with a new language. Click the link in the description below to sign up today and start learning for free. Thank you, Buzu, for sponsoring this video, and back to Chapter 4. Chapter 4. Test Yourself So remember how in Chapter 1, the group that kept testing themselves outperformed the group that kept reading? Well, that wasn't just a fluke or lone example. It was actually demonstrating another well-documented phenomenon known as the testing effect. It's the finding that retrieving information from memory produces better long-term retention than simply reviewing the same material. While researchers have known about this effect for over a century, a 2014 meta-analysis by Christopher Rowland provides the clearest picture yet of how and when it works. Rowland analyzed 159 effect sizes from 61 studies across four decades, and he found that, for retention, testing beat restudying 81% of the time, with a noticeable effect size. The analysis also revealed three caveats that you need to be aware of. First, the test has to be challenging enough. When Roland analyzed different kinds of tests, he found that recall tests, where you have to actively generate an answer, provided greater benefits than simple recognition tests, like multiple choice. Second, you need to actually retrieve the information successfully. This was perhaps the most important finding. When students' performance dropped below 50% and they didn't get any feedback, the testing effect disappeared almost entirely. After all, you can't strengthen memories that you can't access. And third, the benefits grow over time. Testing showed moderate advantages after just minutes, but over days and weeks, the gap between testing and restudying widened dramatically. It's a long-term play. Okay, so how do you actually implement this? Well, the key is to replace passive review with active recall. Here are seven methods. Feel free to screenshot these and try them out. If you try any of these, you'll quickly notice that all of these feel way harder than passive review, but that difficulty isn't a bug. It's actually the entire play. As the authors of Make It Stick explain, the easier knowledge or a skill is for you to retrieve, the less your retrieval practice will benefit your retention of it. Conversely, the more effort you have to expend to retrieve knowledge or skill, the more the practice of retrieval will entrench it. So start small. Pick one topic you're currently studying, and instead of rereading the material, 
test yourself on it. But interestingly enough, some research suggests that testing doesn't just work after learning, but can actually prime the mind before learning happens. Chapter 5. Generate First Picture this. You're reading about photosynthesis and you encounter the term chloroplast. You think, I should probably know what that is, so you have two options. Option 1. You immediately Google it, you highlight it, and you move on. Option 2. You pause, you think, chloro, that's like chlorine or Clorox, right? And plast, that's like plastic, right? So it's probably something chlorine and plastic that harms plants. So you guess, then you realize that that answer is completely wrong. It's not that. And then you note down the right answer. Which one do you think is more effective? In 2009, three researchers at UCLA conducted an experiment to figure that out. They presented subjects with weak association word pairs like olive branch or whale mammal in two conditions. The first was a test condition. They were given only one of the words and asked to guess the second word. For example, they'd be shown olive and they'd have to guess what the target is. After attempting to answer, they're shown the correct answer, branch. It's important to note here that students rarely got any right. The average was like one out of 30 pairs that they got. So any answers that they happened to get lucky on were removed from analysis. So we're just looking at unsuccessful retrieval here. The second condition was read only. The pairs were shown together. They then took a memory test after some time. After running the experiment four times with four different setups trying to tease out any confounding variables, the results were clear. Subjects remembered more of the tested pairs than the read-only pairs, even though they were failing during the initial attempts. In other words, struggling and failing to remember something make you learn it better than if you had never struggled at all. But why does this happen? As the authors of Make It Stick write, unsuccessful attempts to solve a problem encourage deep processing of the answer when it is later supplied in a way that simply reading the answer cannot. It's better to solve a problem than to memorize a solution. It's better to attempt a solution and supply the incorrect answer than not to make the attempt. Now to be clear, more research is needed. The studies that we have right now involve primarily small samples, and they also involve very specific learning tasks, so we don't know how well this generalizes to other learning activities. But while researchers continue to figure it out, there are some low-risk ways that you can implement the principle. Before reading a chapter, spend two to three minutes looking at the headings and trying to predict what the chapter will cover. Two, while reading, turn the headings into questions. For example, if you see the causes of World War I, try to answer what caused World War I before reading the section. Three, this one's for language learning and specifically helps me out a lot. When you're learning a new vocabulary word that you don't yet know, try to guess what it means before looking it up. Four, when learning how to solve a new kind of math problem, spend a minute attempting the problem as best as you can before looking at the guide. So let's bring this all together and build our system. And before we do, let's be real. If you've made it this far into the video, you're clearly someone who loves learning. And good news is, that's exactly the community that I'm building here. So if you're a sovereign learner too, then hit subscribe. It's free, takes a second, and helps you get more videos that you'll enjoy. Now onto our four step system. Let's say that you're reading a textbook. Step one, generate first. Read through the text, looking at the titles and headlines, and try to guess what each section is going to be about. Even if you're wrong, again, that's not the point. The point is to prime your semantic network. I personally feed my study materials to an AI like ChatGPT or Claude, and I ask it to pre-quiz me on the material without feedback or spoilers. Step two, active engagement. As you read through the text, make a conscious effort to understand the key ideas and connect them to your existing knowledge. I do this by taking notes in Obsidian where I can make links between my notes and populate this beautiful web of knowledge. Step three, plug the leak. Immediately after finishing a learning session, close your book and try to freely recall everything you can. Once you're done, open your notes and correct any mistakes. In my case, I have the LLM quiz me and grade me on my answers. And finally, step four, spaced practice. Within 24 hours or so of your initial learning session, test yourself again. This could be a self quiz, explaining the concept to a friend, or creating flashcards. Then continue testing yourself at regular spaced out intervals. So in line with everything we've covered today, I'm challenging you to directly apply the principles you learned on this video and test yourself without looking, what were the five chapters mentioned in this video? And what was each chapter's takeaway? Type your answer in a comment below. And if you wanna see how I approach language learning, watch this video next.